Hello again, BookTube. It's Pete. I'm in the usual situation, which is that I sat up out on my patio to start recording, and then someone decided that would be a good time to start banging a hammer on a piece of aluminum or something, piece of aluminum siding for a while, uh, which is probably a, just as good a thing to do on a Sunday afternoon as what I'm doing. But anyway... It's time for me to do the booktube newbie tag, and I'll try and go fast, as fast as I can, which is not very fast if you look at the timestamps on my other videos. I wanted to uh, get a little bit of, some people do it as their very first video, I didn't obviously. There's some advice I heard early on from Ollie Criminali when he was being interviewed on MJ's channel, where he advised people to wait a few months so you have some content on there. For people to look at if they like your your newbie tag and uh, I went with that advice because it was also the way I wanted to do it because I really wanted to see if I was going to keep doing this because if I wasn't going to do it what would be point what if you're watching this and you've done your newbie tag and then you stopped recording after that because I've seen dozens and dozens of these where channels where they have three videos they have their newbie tag they have their first unboxing and they have a third video and then they stop so don't stop if you happen to still be watching a lot and you've already started your channel just start doing more videos i've dropped out a couple times and come back people are always happy with that i really encourage you if you had the had the uh inclination or the desire to start a booktube channel in the first place to to revive it if you haven't been doing that because people want to see your content it doesn't have to be perfect it's kind of better if it's not frankly for some of us anyway i'll start i'll stop rambling and do the things uh book two newbie tag questions why did you start this channel it's been a while since i i listened to a lot of these and another advantage of that is i forgot uh what people said i remember that almost everybody said the same thing I'm going to say on this one, so I'll try and drill down a little more on it. I was lonely for, for people to talk about books with. In my situation, I retired last year, last April, so almost exactly a year ago. That's another good reason to do this newbie tag today. It's my one-year anniversary of retirement, and I started traveling. Before then, I was very lucky with the last job I had, which... I might make a video about it at some point. It was sort of kind of book related, not really. It was a it was a menial job, a warehouse job that I really liked. It was not at Amazon, even though I'm from Seattle. Um, but there was a group of us there who really uh, liked books and talked about books a lot, and and it was a sort of a low stress job, so we were able to do our jobs and still blab about books all day and things that were important to us. Over the years, the staff turned over a lot, a lot of turnover at that job. And uh, didn't have the same kind of group of people working there anymore. And that was one of the reasons I decided to retire. I could have stayed there another six months or a year, but there were some issues that that I just wasn't having fun at work anymore. And I did have everything sort of in place. What I didn't expect, and I, I knew I might get kind of lonely on the road and stuff. I'm, If you haven't seen my other videos, I'm traveling in Europe now. I'm, I'm in the Balkans. I'm in Albania. I'll be here another six months. Before, before this, I was in uh, a brief time in uh, the Nordic countries. A couple weeks in Sweden was all. And then a few months in uh, Finland which I really like, but I can't afford that. Um, Albania is much more affordable. Oh, boy, I'm going to lose track again. Um, okay, so I, I knew I might have trouble meeting people and stuff because of language differences and traveling alone and being an older traveler and thing, and I don't really get lonely very much. I have a good network of, of family and friends back home and things like that. What I didn't expect was because I have so much more reading time and less audiobook time because I used to listen uh, to my headphones at work, so I don't really do very much audiobook listening anymore, but I do read a lot more than I had been able to do in the last five or ten years. Any people that are working, of course, know what that's like. 
but I would finish these books and I finished a, few, a couple books, especially early on, a couple of series that I, I really wanted to read for a long time, like Lawrence Durrell's Alexandria Quartet and uh, uh, Anthony Powell's Dance to the Music of Time, which is 12 volumes, 12 short volumes. But And I had no one to talk to this stuff about. You know, it's not like you can, I can text my friends back in the States and say, hey, you know, I just read... Dance the music of time, and here are all my thoughts on it. And, and then just start firing off texts. I used to write about books that I I wanted to tell people about on Facebook, and I've said some of this in my other videos. Facebook, for people who are still using it, probably know that it's just impossible to see what your friends have put there, and impossible for your friends to see what you've put there, you know, in between all the... Uh, uh, for some reason, I'm not vegetarian. For some reason, I constantly get vegan uh, ads all day long, and uh, you know various different uh, s sort of crap thing. You know, and you click on something one time, and then you're doomed for the rest of your life to just see just scam, spam after spam after spam. And so I don't know whether a lot of my friends aren't really using Facebook very much, or I just don't see what what they're posting because I know that happens with other people. So I do post a little bit there, just kind of personal things for friends and jokes and things. But I really uh, didn't see much value in writing like long book reviews. Also, I'm pretty lazy when it comes to writing nonfiction types of things and I'm not a very good uh, copy editor so I have to go over and over any piece of writing I do any piece of like say four pages or whatever I have to go over and over and over it to get the typos and all that because some people are very upset about that if you uh, type if you put a typo in a Facebook Facebook post that's all people want to talk about so I thought well what if, what if I could just talk about books I just need to find people I can talk about books with and uh, traveling and, and not staying in one place you know I don't have opportunity to make long-term friends like that I mean there's a there's like a writing group in Tirania which is the, which is the capital of Albania where I'm going to be staying in a few months and I thought oh, I'll go meet people at something like that and but you know I'll be moving on for a while I'm not ready to set down roots so that's part of the reason the other reason is for a long time I'm not going to spend this much time on each question I promise most of the time is going to be spent on this why question, the first one. Lost my train of thought again. Oh, I've always spent a lot of time on YouTube. And I've gone through different phases on YouTube. And I guess I've never really thought of it until recently as a social media network at all. Uh, I'm one of those people who would just watch things. I would never subscribe to anybody's channel. I would never hit the like button. I would never like and subscribe like they always ask you to do. And um, so I don't, I try not to ask people to do that too much because I didn't do it. And what I used it for is mostly information. I never really thought about the creators or anything or personalities. There are a couple exceptions. I'm learning Spanish. There's a great comprehensible input channel called Dreaming Spanish, which is all the content is in Spanish uh, for people who don't speak Spanish, so there's different levels of easy ones and stuff. And I sort of, you know, it's kind of like a soap opera in a way. You get, you get, uh, you get interested in some of the, some of the regular posters there and, and, you know, they become, uh, become fans of certain ones and things like that. So I, I see why people hang out on certain channels, but I've always gone through phases with YouTube. Like when I was trying to figure out how to retire and all that, I, you know, watched all finance crap all the time, all the time. You know, you, you pretty much find after a few months or a year of that that, you know, there's only so much you need to know about that subject. And then I would move on to another subject. Or there's a lot of those faceless channels um, where they talk about, like, bro subjects, uh, like uh, philosophy. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, channels that you know do a lot of um uh coverage of different philosophers and you know Nietzsche and very popular of course all the Stoics uh who's the other one Dostoevsky so I'd watch a lot of those Fiction Beast I think is my favorite of all those channels that guy works hard 
to make all these videos. But he also has another side to it, and this is kind of leading back to BookTube, where he, he'll talk about, he'll do these these video wrap-ups, like the 10 best Chinese novels of the, of the last 20 years and all that. So he's very widely read. Uh, he, he reads, he writes scripts. His videos are half an hour, an hour long. He writes scripts. He obviously reads them himself instead of having like a chat bot read it. Um, and, you know, when AI started really hitting strong a couple of years ago, the, those kind of channels just became so flooded with so much crap that I kind of got bored with those too. And I knew that there was something called BookTube, but, and I apologize to everyone out there who's been so active in this community for a long time. I thought it was, I had the completely wrong idea of it. And I thought it was something that would never interest me because I thought it was all uh, young people reviewing YA books in like a very, uh, uh, very high tech, um, sponsor seeking kind of, uh, kind of, um, format, you know, and of course there's a lot of that and I'm not interested in those kind of books so much and I'm not really interested in really polished content. I'm really more interested in just people who care about what they what they care about. One of the greatest videos, when I first started watching YouTube, one of the most fascinating videos I thought I found was this guy who got he had like $5,000 together or something like that, goes to the bank, gets all these half dollars, you know, $5,000 worth of half dollars or whatever it was, $3,000 worth, goes through them all, goes through all of them, so that's, you know, however many coins that is, opens them all up, goes through them, pulls out, finds ones that are actual silver, half dollars or you know more expensive ones and he pulled out like 300 300 of those coins which was which made him hundreds of dollars then he took all the coins back to the bank and I thought man this guy this is great this guy made a video about this I mean that's when I thought Hollywood was doomed it's like it's just normal people doing fascinating things that they love to do um, that's going to kill Hollywood before all this these fake chat uh G GTP pseudo movie things where somebody types in uh, Star Wars with Captain Kirk, you know, that's not going to replace movies. But anyway, but actual re real people just doing their unvarnished stuff it does take a lot of, it does have a lot of entertainment value. So once I, and then one day I happened to click on Michael K. Vaughn's channel because I was looking for some classic looking for something about some cla some classic book and he he has this channel about some the his 10 time all time favorite classic or something it's going on and on about books i remember lord of the rings was one most of them were like more mainstream classics not genre stuff um and i noticed on his wall he's got like he's got like these deluxe editions of the james blish star trek original series novelizations and he's got uh, Conan, and he's got comic books, and he's got, uh, you know, all these beautiful editions, collector's editions of, of these different kind of things. And I thought, well, here's a guy like me, and this, again, I'm sorry, I just didn't know about this community. I really thought there were very few people like this who like to read classics and who like to read genre fiction. I thought there were very few people like that anymore, and Michael K. Vaughn's pr probably at least a decade younger than me. And so I thought this was just something that went out of fashion that like today everybody seemed to me was like really adamant about I only read important books or I only read my one genre that I learned to read when my parents gave me Harry Potter. And so that I had a very narrow view of what people were interested in talking about. So I started watching his channel and I watched a lot of his videos and of course the algorithm which really does work. You can't really blame YouTube for the algorithm. You, you have to blame yourself. I started getting all these wonderful channels, you know, people he would reference and then just others that would come up. Um, and I found some of the people that I liked the most there and I really enjoyed everybody's different channels. More about their personalities and their their sincerity and their passion for books than about whatever specific genre they're even talking about because it's a great way to uh, booktube is a great way to find things to read but it's also just a great way to talk about what other to hear about what other people want to read it's like going to a party 
and seeing somebody's books. And if you're a book person, you know that if you're a real book person, you don't only care about the books you like. You care about what other people are reading just because it's a whole fascinating area to you. At least I do. And so that's why I'm starting a channel because I want to be part of that. I wanted to blab on about books and not have to force anybody to sit down and listen to me. You know, you can turn off at any time. And I'm guessing from my stats that about 80% of the people who were listening to this 10 minutes ago are gone by now. And that's fine because that's, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to become anything else except just another blowhard who talks about books because he likes them and the people who find it uh, hopefully will enjoy that. What fun and unique thing do you bring to BookTube? That's the second question. It's a kind of irritating question. Uh, nothing really because... Nothing and everything because no matter what I could say about myself demographically, there's already somebody doing it. If I could find the most unique thing, like I'm the only former Seattleite from who retired and is li currently living in, in Albania doing booktube today. Uh, and that's probably not even true. There's probably others in English. Um, but what I think I can do is I decided early on not to care about production values at all. I did go early on into a rabbit hole of watching a lot of this is another thread of, of YouTube of watching a lot of you can make money on YouTube kind of videos, not f just for the purpose of making money, but more for the purpose of seeing how to do it well. Like, okay, I need a light, but it's got to be a light I can travel with. and I need a stand for my, and I need a good microphone. And I don't carry all this stuff. And, and I thought I would do some more editing and, and, and that kind of thing. But then when I looked at these online editing programs, I was like, oh, all these levers and, I don't want to learn all this stuff, so I just decided I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna edit. I'm not gonna do anything. I wasn't even gonna do thumbnails at first because, in my opinion, the best thumbnails on BookTube, bar none, is Steve Doninger, because his face, because he's always got a grin on his face. He doesn't do a thumbnail, so it's just the first image that comes up. And that, talk about branding. If people want to brand, uh, he's got a brand because you know his videos because you know his face. But anyway, I did, I did do a couple, um, I did learn how to make um, thumbnails real quickly, so I do enjoy that. So I did do that, but other than that, obviously I'm not editing. I don't even pause the thing because I'm afraid if I pause it, I'm not going to be able to restart the same video. I'm either going to lose it or I'm going to have two separate videos and I don't know how to put them together or anything. And so I decided I'm just going to do the fun part. And as long as I get uh, at least 10 subscribers, I was hoping for it originally, just for the illusion of not speaking into the void. And okay, so that is what I bring to it. I bring the ability to show you that I'm so bad at it and it's not stopping me and there are people that like it actually, a few here and there. So you should not let that stop you either. That's the unique thing I'm just saying. It's kind of a, it's a punk rock attitude, I guess, if you want to be, uh, you know, late 70s, early 80s about it to say like, we're just going to do it. We don't know how to play. We're just doing it for fun and you can too. And that's how you make friends is you don't cut yourself off from other people and just do what you enjoy and then the people who enjoy it with you will have a good time and the other people you don't have to worry about because there's plenty of stuff they can do okay what are you most excited about in starting your channel uh well nothing really that i can't can't say i really already covered i'm excited about the opportunity to to do it and uh and to have the the forum just to talk about any anything that's on my mind because I, I find that most things I can relate back to books somehow because I love books so much and they're such a big part of my life. And I'm excited to meet new people and hear about their channels. I'm always excited when someone comments on my channel and I'm, or if they uh, subscribe to my channel and they've got open and if they've 
they haven't hidden their subscribers, I can see that they're subscribed, and then I can subscribe back to them. Uh, so I like meeting new people and and having this in common with so many different types of people. Oh, why do you love reading? That's a tough one. That's a big one, right? I will ponder it. I had answers for all these originally when I first started watching them, but that was so long ago, and I haven't watched them in a while. I love reading because I, I love hearing stories. I love being outside my own mind. I like connecting with other people. I like thinking, which is fun. I like thinking about stuff. I like living vicariously through others' lives. I like wordplay. I just enjoy the sound of the language. It's been so long that, I mean, you know, each book is, you know, you're so limited in what you can do as a human being, no matter who you are, no matter how privileged you are, or how many places you can go, you, you're you always in your same body, you're always in your same mindset, you're always with your same history, and you can get out of that through fiction and through, and through history or through any kind of book by just being... Uh, riding along in the mind of someone else and that's probably enough about that what book or series got you into reading okay there's a couple different answers I guess the Dick and Jane series uh, do I have this for another okay so what book or series got you into reading when I was in first grade I was, the teacher did a very good job of separating all the students to greeting very seriously. She, uh, they separated us into different groups. I was in the lowest group. I was in the dumbest reader group. And by the end of the year, I was in the top reader group. And I've, that's always stuck with me because, and you know, a lot of that was my mom too, who spent a lot of time reading with me. My brother was completely opposite. He was two years younger, was completely opposite, never liked reading, you know, barely read, could barely read at his, at his level by the end of high school. Um, so I always think about that. Like, what if I'd had a different first grade teacher? You know, we didn't have video games when I was a kid, but I'm really glad I wasn't born like 10 years later. I probably would have just be a video game guy because I just like stories. And, you know, we had TV, of course, but I lived in a small town, only had a couple channels. There was no cable when I was a kid. There was really never anything on for kids. But then you go to the library, you go to the school library, or you, or you go to the public library in Sparks, Nevada, where I lived. <laughs> And there's just so many worlds open up for you everywhere. I remember uh, there was under the Christmas tree one year, there was a brick of uh, square brick with light colored wrapping on it. And I was spreading the wrapping, trying to see what kind of was in there. And I could feel there was three books. I'm looking in there. And I don't know if I figured it out or not. I could see these pictures of these two, two figures on the spine of the books. They're blue books. Maybe this is bringing it into view for somebody for some people but it turned out they were the hardy boys books the first three books in the hardy boys series and i thought that was really cool and i did enjoy those books and they're probably about the only kids books i ever read because what really got me going and this goes back to michael vick Kavon's channel was tarzan was comic books and especially Tarzan, because I was a big reader of DC Comics. And I liked the war, I liked the superhero comics, I really liked the war comics. Joe Kubert's Sergeant Rock was my favorite, one of my favorites, great artist. There was, at the time, uh, Gold Key had the Tarzan comic books. There was, a, uh, there was an artist named Russ Manning who drew the Gold Key comic books. They were ending, and it was announced in like the material that comes out in your DC comic coming soon to DC Comics, to Tarzan. We're gonna start Tarzan. So I was excited because I liked Russ Manning. I read the the daily Tarzan comic strip, and I had one or two copies of the comics. So I was really excited. Tarzan was gonna do DC, was gonna become a DC character, 
And then they said Joe Kubert was going to draw it and write it. And I was first I was upset. I remember this to this day, how upset I was about that. Because Joe Kubert to me represented realism. And Sergeant Rock was a realistic character. And I thought at that time of Tarzan as a superhero. Russ Manning had like more like the rounded sort of traditional sort of uh, a little bit closer to how superheroes were drawn. Not really, but you know, in my eight-year-old mind or whatever it was, I you know I had to be older than that, I think. Can't remember what year it is. Somebody will know when DC printed their first Tarzan issue, Tarzan 206 or 207, I think. Is where they, they just picked up the numbering. That was another confusing thing. It's like, what? how can you be... How can this be the 207th issue of DC's Tarzan when it's the first issue that I've ever seen? And, of course, it picked up right after the gold key numbering because they, they just they just bought the rights and they brought that character over and they brought Korak over, which is the son of Tarzan, who also had a successful book for a while, even though he's not a major character in Burroughs. I mean, he is, he's in one book, at least, that I know of. So... But immediately I knew I was wrong. As soon as I saw that first Tarzan issue and what Tarzan really was, because these were faithful adaptations. This was a faith, the first uh, run of Tarzan was a, a serious adaptation of the ori ed original Edgar Rice Burroughs novels, starting with Tarzan of the Apes. And of course, Joe Kubrick's art, art is perfect for that. You know, this is pre World War I. Story or that actually starts out in the 1880s, I think, when Charles was born. I think in uh, John Clayton would be born in, I think, around 1888 or 89, where his parents are marooned, uh, you know, in Africa, and he gets they get killed, and he gets raised by the apes, who are not gorillas; they're great apes. They're this this different fictional spirit, fictional species of apes that can speak their own language, where words like Tarzan come from, and Tantor, the elephant, and Numa, and all, all the different, it was very sort of Mowgli-ish kind of, I'm sure that Burroughs was a big Jungle Book fan. Anyway, you know, that first issue of Tarzan, that first DC issue of Tarzan also had a, like a one-page description of Edgar S. Burroughs, like a mini biography, and talked about the books. I'm like, there are Tarzan novels? There are books? whole books about Tarzan and my mom was like oh yeah so like, how did I how what and uh, I went to my library in the school and I said do you have any books by Edgar Rice Burroughs and they're like yeah we have this one Tarzan and the Jewels of Opar so I was like oh my god this book's like 600 pages long it was Grosset and Dunlap uh, red cover version of Tar Tarzan, the Jewels of o Opar. Out of sequence, didn't care. I was like, this is a 500, 600 page. It probably was. It probably like 350 with like big print. I was like, all oh, about Tarzan. I can't wait to read this. So I read that. And then I thought, okay, well, that's all they have, but I got to find more. I went to the city library, Sparks Library. Uh... I was born in 1961, so we were allowed to walk to the library on our own, and I was never abducted, incredibly, uh, and murdered. So I go to the library by myself, and I go to the card catalog, and I've been there a lot. And this library is pretty small, like a lot of small suburban libraries. Half of half of the half of the building is kids' books, big kids' section. The other half is adult books. The the uh, staff and the the counter and all that's in the middle and the cards because there was no computers back then obviously the card files were opposite the counter so I look I'm looking at Gross Burrows B Burrows 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 get the number call number shit it's on the adult side they had I think they had about three books I know they had Jungle Tales of Tarzan because that was the second one I read completely actually they had at least the first. Yeah, I think they had more than that, but I remember reading that one early on. I was still not, I still did not care about the order. I just wanted all of them, and I go, it's on the adult side. Do I have to ask permit? But if I knew if I asked permission, they said no, I was fucked, right? So I just casually start walking over to the adult side. Nobody stops me. 
I didn't know that was a thing. Obviously, you know, I know now that's not a deal, uh, a thing. Like, uh, they're not adult books. You're not, you're not forbidden from reading books in any part of the library. Um, and I thought, I'm going to take this to the counter and give it to the lady to check out. She's going to yell at me that I'm too young to be reading this book or whatever. Because uh, it was an issue my parents kind of had. They were always afraid I'd read above my level. I don't know what terrible thing is going to happen to a child if they read a book that's too hard for them. I think what parents think is that you're going to read, you know, I'll pick up, you know, I, as an 11-year-old, I'll pick up Tristram Shandy or Finnegan's Wake and I'll read two pages and go, this is garbage. I'm never touching another book because no one stopped me from reading this experimental, confusing crap. You know, I don't know what they think is going to happen. The worst that's ever happened to me with reading another uh, book I couldn't understand is I got bored. The second most common thing would be I would just read it harder or I would read it again or I'd just pass on. Don't tell people not to read books that are too, that are above their level. That's the stupidest thing you could do to any kid or to anybody. And I, and that goes for language learning too. I'm studying Spanish. I've been studying a couple of years. I'm not going to sit there and read eighth fourth grade readers I'm going to read books I'm interested in and if I don't understand them I'll read them slower and, or I'll read parts again or I'll put them aside for later and only read things you're interested in don't worry about whether you are smart enough to read it that's the thing about reading and people's attitudes towards reading that makes me madder than anything obviously obviously I was terribly traumatized and brutalized as a child so it's always stayed with me Okay, so that was why I loved reading. What book or series got you into reading? That was that. So it was the Edgar S. Burroughs books. Here's another confession. I I did not read all of those. I'm probably the only really crazy Burroughs kid who didn't read all the Tarzan books. Even though I had a bunch of them, I probably had the first 12 at least. I only read the first six. Um... Mars books, of course, just as good. The Mar the first Barson trilogy, the first three books, fantastic. I had all eleven of those. Got to Thuvia, made of Mars, and I just it just seemed so bad to me. It seemed so dull. I don't care about. I care about John Carter and Dejah Thoris. That's who I care about. I don't care about their stupid kids, you know, grown up and Thuvia is the, the enamorata of. Uh, Thoris, who is the son of, of John and Dejah Thoris, and, and I said, I don't care about this kid. I want to see what's happening to my real heroes. And uh, and I did try and reread that as an adult a few years ago, and I still didn't care, but uh, it's I think it's maybe, it's a pretty weak Burroughs novel. So what I read besides the first six Tarzan novels and the first three Mars novels, and I know this is like sacrilege to anybody to all the Burroughs people out there that I never read the rest of them because I would bog down because they started to, you know, especially the first three uh, return. Well, if you include Jungle Tales, which is six, which is a prequel adventures of Tarzan's early days before he was discovered by, uh, human, uh, by civilization, discovers he's a British lord and all that stuff. The, so the, the main books are uh, Tarzan of the Apes, first one, The Return of Tarzan. This kind of completes his origin story. The third book, he's got this arch enemy guy named Nicholas Rokoff, and I remember the third book, The Beast of Tarzan, starts with like, Nicholas Rokoff has escaped, or something like that. So I was like, oh my god, the guy's back out. Uh, this evil guy who hates Tarzan is back out. The fourth one is Son of Tarzan, which is a, a really good book compared to, especially compared to um, Thuvia Made of Mars or, or Son of John Carter which I didn't care that much about um, then the fifth one I like I had said I already read that was Tarzan the Jewels of Opar which was a direct sequel to Return of Tarzan because Tarzan of the Jewels of Opar is Tarzan's return to the city of Opar and there's a love triangle there because uh, besides Jane there's the Priestess Law the leader of, 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 of Opar very interesting society where the women are all gorgeous Amazons and the men are like all creepy cavemen guys. Uh, Burroughs is really good at, at making up these really bizarre mini cultures. 
uh, that crop up all over his different worlds, you know, or in the middle of the Earth, or on Venus, or Mars, or any place. Um, and then when Tarzan the Untamed came along, it was like, it really does, Michael Kivan has mentioned, mentioned this too, he's, it really is a, a, a different phase of the series. So there's Tarzan the Untamed, where I believe uh, Tarzan loses his memory for a while. For a while, there was really kind of a, Burroughs was spending a lot of time trying to get Tarzan back to the wild state because he became, he'd become, he's basically just this rich guy who has a big, big plantation in Africa and he's like, now he's educated and he's really very much part of civilization. Um, so they have to keep getting him back to the point where he can, he can just be running around naked in the jungle with his, with his uh, tools and fighting people and talking to the animals. So I kind of burned out on those series, and what I focused on a lot was a lot of Burroughs wrote, a lot of standalone novels, a lot of shorter series. I like the Venus books, even though supposedly he started that series later, and I just happened to be the, one of the first ones I re- read, one of the first ones I owned were two books I owned, a little paperbacks I found a used bookstore of At the Earth's Core and Escape on Venus. So the first Pellucidar book, at the Earth's core, which you can probably guess from the title where that one takes place, and Escape on Venus, which is the fourth of four full Carson and Venus books, and it's kind of a workup. It's like four novellas that are put together, where he's just wandering around Venus, um, you know, encountering different cultures, and of and of course the Caspian series, the Land That Time Forgot, People That Time Forgot, and Out of Time's Abyss. Which put them all together, it's probably like a 300 page book, but I really love those a lot. And there was one called Beyond 30, which has got a similar kind of premise as uh, People at the Time Forgot, but set in the future. And The Monster Man, and The Cave Girl, and The Moon Man, and just all these different books that that uh, I really enjoyed by him. So he was really what got me most excited in reading. I would say that's the series, more than The Hardy Boys. I read The Hardy Boys for a while. Pretty excited about those early on, but I felt like they weren't really at the same level as Burroughs. You know, there's um, Hardy Boys seems directed at at a specific audience. Young boys, obviously, young people who are not reading Nancy Drew, and. It, I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's nothing wrong for writing books for a specific audience, but we're, but we're the people, the guy who, or the woman who wrote, was it a guy? I think it was a guy who created the series, wrote the first three books, then it was handed over to a woman, and they were all written, all the Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys books, at least the early ones, were all written by the same person. And we're, so was that creator, that book packager guy who created those two series and the person who continued writing the series, were they writing books that they really loved or was this just their job to write these books for kids? Whereas Burroughs was writing books he loved for an audience like him of people who lo- loved high adventure stories. So I always felt like it was on a, I always felt like when I started reading Burroughs, and other, a few other kids' books. I remember I read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory whatever year Willy Wonka came out. I was in fifth grade. And, you know, those seem like real books. Those seem like books that are written by a living person who was writing what they wanted to write about from their own twisted minds, whereas Hard, Hardy Boys seem more like, a, more like a TV series. You know, there's probably things in there that had to be a certain pub- way for the publishers. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, that's the real world we live in and all that. But I just didn't feel like they were real books in the sense of the, those others that I've mentioned, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's a series. I'm halfway through, and it's uh, 30 minutes. Okay, I apologize. Go ahead and click off now, I think, if you want. Uh, like, you need my permission, but... Okay, book or series got you into reading. Okay, what questions would you ask your favorite booktubers? How do you get transcripts? I noticed some videos have transcripts. Um, is that something you have to go online to do yourself and put your video through? Or, or I've never really seen a, a, a box to check or uncheck 
on a YouTube creator to to get transcripts, but I think that would kind of I'd kind of like to have those just for my my own self, so I could refer back to stuff. What if this isn't recording? That happened to me the other day. I did one that was almost an hour. It didn't record, or or I clicked off the the window. I'm on a um, Chromebook. That's all I have. It's another reason I I'm more limited in what I can do because I when I retired and when I went traveling I bought a tiny little Chromebook you know I had no intention of ever doing anything like this so I don't have anything set up I just have to work with what I've got which is why which is what I think is the is the best way to do it and I hope people are doing that too don't don't put any money in this I saw a video once where this woman was saying she spent she earned three dollars an hour doing booktube she had like twenty thousand subscribers i won't link to it you could probably find it but and i i really liked her video because she was honest about what she was making which was good but she puts a lot of money into it and and she was also being if you if you want to make money you have to do the things that make money like she was talking about and i admire her for this she was she they were trying to get her to put commercials in the middle, okay, uh, commercials in the middle of her video. She wouldn't do it because she thought it ruined the video. But on the other hand, she's spending all this money on equipment and lighting and editing and hours and hours. And Anyway, uh, that's her thing. But I, I really appreciated her video uh, about $3 an hour because it, it, that, and that was another video that made me decide I want to do this because, oh, great, if there's no money in it, you know, if you if you if you're only averaging three dollars an hour, you know, based on the twenty hours it takes her to do each one video, um, and you're only making three bucks an hour, and you're spending forty hours a week on it, that frees me to never have to worry about money and never be tempted into thinking this could be a job for me. For other people, it can. If you're young and stuff, and you're and you're working those, and you're working that, and you're out there hustling. You got to do what you got to do. And I wish you all the best of luck with it. And you have to find a different way to find an audience and stuff. But fortunately, I don't care about any of that. So that's a privilege I have that I don't have to, I'm not trying to make money off this. Okay, what question? So that was my question for the favorite booktubers. Like, how do you do transcripts? I guess that's a question. I could figure that out on my own. I'm sure, so don't bother answering unless you want to, but uh, I find, in terms of questions I ask people, I find people are very helpful, I think people are very open, um, there's been some people who have been very supportive already that I just I should just shout out here that um, I'm really grateful to have their, you know, their guidance and their advice um, not on a personal level, well, a little bit, you know, but people have addressed me in videos and stuff, like like MJ from Reading This Life. She's very supportive of new booktubers, obviously. That's almost her whole thing is being supportive of other people. And, you know, and she shouted me out once, and, and I really appreciate that. So I feel people are very open and welcoming. Welcoming Kelly at Books I'm Not Reading has also been very open and welcoming and and very supportive of my channel and it's like so nice and so flattering when when people who with these big channels big you know compared to us newbies take the time you know to reach out and all that it's really fun and uh mark from uh from book time with elvis was who also had a, a, a video about why you should do a channel so i'll uh, I'll link to all these people, of course, but he's got one of the best you should start a booktube channel, one of the most encouraging ones, and he was very nice to uh, send out a link and stuff when he noticed I had a channel going, so was, he's all, they've all been very helpful as my buddy also at Faceless Book Reviews. I don't know if he even uses his name. I don't even think I know his name. That's how it is with your YouTube buddies. You don't even know. My name's not even Pete, but I like to use Pete here because... My real name's Michael, but uh, I don't really like the name Mike, and I do all my other social media under my real name, which you can find if you go to my channel's description. I don't put it in every video description, but you can find my 
my web page and my links to my writing and all that stuff. But I just wanted to have like uh, a different sort of persona because if I'd started over with writing and all that originally, I would have just made up a name anyway. And I think I like the name Pete, so I go by Pete. Okay, so what challenges hurdle? Okay. Oh, what questions would you ask? So what challenges or hurdles do you have starting your channel? Um, I have a big document of stuff I wanted to talk about originally. And some of, now that I'm into it more, I find a lot of that stuff gets pushed to the side because I have more of an idea of how YouTube works as a social media network. I didn't. I knew about this tag, of course. I knew about some other tags. I didn't know about all these challenges, and I love the challenges, and they're so cool. There's so many cool challenges going up, and, and it's not like I don't want to do them all because I do want to do them all. I really want to do them all, and they are so much fun, and I've gotten a lot of reading done in different areas that I wouldn't have done like I'm, I'm working right now and there's no place like Rome. I finished the first volume of Decline and Fall of, oh, I almost said Western Civilization. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which is six volumes, and I've had that forever, and I probably would have never gotten around to it if it wasn't for the No Place Like, like Rome Challenge, and I love the first volume, and it's even giving me ideas for things I want to do outside of uh, outside of book, booktube so and the 100 book challenge is great because I've got so much stuff on my Kindle I haven't read so it's really helping me a lot uh, but the challenge is and the hurdles are I've met so many great people in such a short time and there's so many channels I love that it's very hard for me to get to all of them I would, I could literally sit here all day and watch BookTube, and I'm sure, and then I would have nothing to talk about because I wouldn't have any time to read, and I wouldn't have any time to do my own writing, and I'm supposed to eventually, uh, you know, pretend to enjoy being a tourist and 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 at least take walks. You know, there's a lot of things I want to do, and now this is, YouTube is one more thing I want to do. It's not, it's not like uh, these videos. Where you feel like, I'm leaving BookTube, it's just too hard, it takes so much time, and all that. Because, uh, I mean, that's all self-imposed, but I do really struggle with wishing I had more time to, to spend watching other people's channels. And also, uh, posting on a consistent basis, I get really into it for a while, and I post a lot. And I'll start posting, and, I, and I, sometimes it feels like, I'm losing one subscriber every time I post. A new videos like uh, enough of this guy let me unsubscribe just you can you can take off the alerts if you want you know so you can keep the subscription but just to remove the notifications by going into the bell and but I understand if people don't want to do that it's too hard to figure out but I uh, you know intellectually I know that people shouldn't uh, subscribe if they're not interested in the content and it's not a big deal if they're not interested but it does feel like I'm sometimes I'm like alienating people just by posting so much and then I posted too little for a while I'm just, I haven't got into a really good rhythm of it uh, I would hope that people could ignore my videos and just cherry pick the ones that are interested to them, that's what I do with other people. Um, I don't want to tell people how to watch YouTube, but I don't think it has to be all or nothing. I have a few videos that I know no one's going to like because I've seen what they've done in the past, and and but I enjoy doing them. So I really just do this channel for me, the way that Quentin Tarantino makes movies. I heard him in an interview once where he goes, "I make movies for an audience, but the audience is me." And it really comes through in his work. I know a lot of people hate Tarantino, but you really know he's making the kind of movies that he wants, that he likes, that he thinks are going to be awesome. He's not making them for anybody else. But he's also, so he's projecting an audience of people like him out there. He also knows that there are lots of people like him that are going to listen to that stuff. Now, there's not as many people like, like that for me, for this channel, who just want to hear some 
old guy blather on forever about next to nothing and oh man i should probably just quit this video because no one's going to watch an hour long books uh newbie tag anyway what can you do i know one person will watch it and god love him he's my bud thanks very much you know who you are maybe i could leave the uh the chapter thing on this so that so people can skip skip around to the questions. Okay, when did you start reading? I covered that kind of... I think I can wrap up here. When did you start reading? I covered that kind of when I talked about my first grade readers and the, the time my mother bought me the Hardy Boys books and all that. Where do you like to read? Any place except bed? Uh, because I've had... Over the years, I've had trouble sleeping. I think I've about cured that after one year of not working it's very hard, you know, I know all you, you guys know, you guys who are working know, you know, you come home from work and you feel like the only way you can uh, get any enjoyment out of life is to steal from your sleep because your day has been robbed from you. So I used to go to bed quite late and had always had a hard time getting up and always had a hard time sleeping and when I, I did, you know, starting last year, I tried to do some things for my health, the best, and I've been more or less moderately successful up and down with most of them. But the main one was was getting up, sleep, going to bed early, getting up early, get up right now. I get up around 4.30, right? And then I study my Spanish. And then what in the world does this have to do with the question? Okay, so, but then I... I Part of that sleep hygiene was I don't read in bed. I don't do anything in bed except lay down and go to sleep as much as possible. Uh, I'm single, so that's not an issue. Uh, I'm not out there on the market, so that's not an issue. Uh, I don't watch movies in bed. I don't uh, put my I put my phone across the side of the room. I just close my eyes and and I try and relax and. And even if I'm just going to lie there. So I avoid reading in bed, which was for most of my life was where I did most of my reading and developed a bad back from it. And now I don't have a bad back anymore because I used to lay around reading all the time. So I sit, I sit any place. I sit out in the sun. I'll read any place at all, but I do have a no reading in bed rule and it's working out so far and it gets better. You know, if, if you do that, if you get into a situation where you can make your room dark and you can put in earplugs and you can just get in bed at the time you say you want to go to bed, eventually you'll start sleeping the correct hours, the right hours for you, and you'll have enough sleep and then you'll feel better all the time. That's my advice, but it does take a long-ass time to do that. It's not going to take like a week or something. It's going to take a lot longer. And... So that's where I like to read. So I like to read every place I can, including bed, but I do not read in bed. What kind of books do you like to read? Okay, so I touched on this a little bit before when I talked about discovering book through, through mostly th originally through Michael K. Vaughn's channel. Where I like to read everything, almost everything. In fact, I'm not even going to single out. There's a couple of genres I've never read. You know, you can take a look at me. You can probably guess what genres those are that I've never read or read very little in. And I even want to read those genres now because uh, I want to know what's out there and I want to know what people enjoy. I really love the whole world of reading and genre books and literature and I've never been intimidated by uh, literary books or so on. I've never been uh, intimidated by snobs who say you shouldn't read this crap with this cover and and I've never been in, in intimidated by the reverse snobs who say you should you, sh you should never read serious books. So both, both kinds of person are, are awful and I was lucky in that I read John Gardner's books on writing when I was very young. I, one is called The Art of Fiction and the other is called On Becoming a Novelist. I don't remember which one of these this information is in. I think it's in Art of Fiction. He's, where he's mentioning, he's a literary writer, he mentions a, a big list of SF writers that he likes that are, that are quite good. And, you know, when he talks about the Academy not appreciating them and, and the Academy, the quote-unquote Academy, 
you, you know, I remember he said, uh, one he mentioned, he was like, you know, you, you, a, reader, a reader will go to college and they'll think uh, certain writers, like, you know, especially women writers like Pearl Buck or something are really good, but then they'll be told by their professors that they're actually second rate. And, you know, same with science fiction books. And, you know, these are, these are um, prejudices that he experienced growing up you know, back in the, whenever it would have been, probably the 50s or so. So there may be different examples now of what's looked down upon or not, but it's so tedious. So he says it's the revert, the snob and the reverse snob or something like that. Um, they're, they're both just as bad. The person who thinks, uh, you know, you see this on Twitter a lot, but to, they're always making fun of people for liking some serious filmmaker like Tarkovsky or something like, oh, you're so... And Tarkovsky, free information, is a really good filmmaker. And that doesn't mean Batman movies aren't good, too. So the thing that makes me happiest about YouTube is how many other people feel exactly like this about me. How many people will read... Uh, Whoever, you know, Pliny the Younger and Trollope and, and uh, you know, and then, you know, uh, then the uh, Man-Thing and, Th and Marvel, you know, complete run of Marvel's Thor or Man-Thing or something. And that's how it should be. You should be reading what you like. And just because people tell you you're pseudo-intellectual because you like, also like hard books, that's just the stupidest telling People that they're uh, they're lowbrow for only liking trashy books like the uh, Twilight books or whatever it is. Everybody starts somewhere, and everybody is entitled to read the books they want to read. So, what kind of books do you like to read? Okay, what does your book collection look like? Okay, I'm glad I forgot to cover this earlier because the reason I called my channel Bookless Pete is. And that's why I didn't think originally I was going to be able to make a, a YouTube channel or that anybody was going to watch it because the main thing, one of the main things other than the personality of the person that I like is seeing people hold up their books and talk about their books, which I can't do because I don't have any books because I got rid of everything I owned when I, when I moved out of Seattle. I didn't want to have any connection there anymore, so I didn't want to have, uh, I don't intend to go back to the United States, who knows what will happen, but but I didn't want to have a storage shed full of crap that I was never going to look at again or, or just... So I got rid of everything I own, every book, everything except what I have in my bag and on my Kindle. And that was another impetus for starting the channel was just missing just the physical presence of books, which is what got me into watching BookTube as opposed to other kinds of, of tubes, just admiring people's bookshelves. So I thought, well, this channel is not going to be very interesting because... I don't have any books to show people and I do kind of a little bit I'll, I'll hold up my phone or whatever and and I know other people edit in book covers into the corner and point to them and my favorite kind of my my favorite one of my favorite other things on YouTube is when people will go and if you like this video make sure you watch that one and then the video that and then the the window will point up over here you know they're pointing over here <laughs> and the video that, that their intern or whatever puts in is on the other side. Um, so I, I'm not even doing it at that level. I, I finally figured out I could put a, a, a screen grab of a book cover in the, in the title card, or whatever you call it, the thumbnail, I mean. And So that, I think, is a big drawback of my channel, uh, that I don't have any books. But probably if I had books to sit around and admire... Um, I would be doing that instead of uh, making these videos. But man, I love some of these, some of your book collections. I just love so much. I love seeing people's books. I love uh, them holding up all this gorgeous Elvis. Our, our Mark at, at Book Time with Elvis the other day was holding up these new green pengu penguins he had. Um, I'm gonna link to his channel. I don't know if I remember to link to every single video that I've mentioned of other people, but but. Um, the Green Penguins are, are like crime thrillers, crime and, and espionage thrillers. It's like an old series that Penguin Books used to have that we used to them, and, and he has like 10 of them or 20, I forget how many he showed, but I was like, 
oh man, I'm just salivating for these books. So someday when I settle down, uh, like I say, I'm studying Spanish. Uh, eventually I want to settle in South America or s south of uh, the Rio Grande anyway. Who knows what will happen, but you know, maybe I'll have a nice home someplace like start buying books again. But for now, it's all ebooks, which I don't even. If I had to pick one format to be stuck with forever, audio ebooks or physical books, I would definitely pick physical books. I love physical books. I love just the feel. I love the different text and things. Uh, ebooks obviously have their advantages, where you can change the font and all that. And and I have so many unread ones because when I bought my ebook reader. I didn't even really use it that much. I thought this would be cool to have and this is the future of reading because, you know, we were being told, 10 years ago we were being told, just like we we're, were, five years ago we were being told, forget it, driving is over, AI, everything's going to be driverless, there'll be no truck driver, driver jobs, there'll be no train driver job, no taxi drivers, no pizza delivery, it's all going to be automatic. That was all going to be happening by this time. Just like today we're being told by everybody's job is going to go to AI. They're not going to make movies. Uh, you're just going to type. You're just going to read a 10-word prompt into chat GP and it's going to print out the novel that you want to read that's perfect for you. And then you can sell it uh, on Amazon for $10,000 a month. You know, you make all this money from from people who apparently have not thought of using ChatGP themselves to make their own fake novels and put them up on Amazon. Another fad, but the fad 10 years ago was like, books are gone, forget it. You have, you have five years, they're buggy, buggy whips was the phrase everybody used to say, like, you know, because apparently there was a big industry of buddy, buggy whips at one one time. And and when, when horses' carriages came in or when cars came in and carriages went out, there was no more market for buggy whips. And as they're comparing like some specific kind of tool made for one purpose only to whip a horse that's pulling a buggy and they're comparing it to books, which have been around for centuries, for millennium, you know, one form or the other, whether it's scrolls or whatever. Um ridiculous you know i kind of believe them and i believe them about the cars too which is why i don't believe them about the chat ai uh, because you know these people who are boosting all these things are very happy to be all over social media all the time going oh it's going to happen it's going to happen it's going to happen you're a luddite uh you don't know you're gonna don't you know fear fomo fear of missing out uh, don't fall behind learn all this stuff and you know i used to believe them and i thought oh, wait a minute you know, people actually happen to like books and we still have books for that reason. And they're not going away anytime soon because they offer something that print books, that uh, electronic books don't offer. For one, they offer a chance to get off your screen, which is something that everybody wants to do. So forgive me if I'm not uh, going to panic any longer when they tell me that some crazy new technology is going to change the paradigm forever, the disruption. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but ebooks are very helpful when you travel because you can carry thousands with you. Okay, that's what. So my book collection looks like a bunch of files on a computer. And that's just how I have to deal with it. Okay, so. Thank you very much for the people who stayed with us. My name is Bookless Pete. If you want to subscribe, please do so. If you want to hit the like button, please do so. If you want to leave a nice comment, please do so. If you want to leave a, a nasty comment, um, go ahead. I'll just block it. I haven't had to block any comments. So and that's another thing is people are, are so nice on BookTube. Um, The one thing I need to do is think of a sign-off, though. That is the one commercial or, or at least professional thing, kind of thing I need to do because I can never end these videos. But if I had some phrase to say, like when people say bye for an hour, thank you, BookTube, or, or, or there's some really sweet ones that I won't repeat here because, uh, you know, I don't want to misquote them or anything, but Kelly's got a really nice one. And 
And a lot of people have their phrase, which would be very helpful because then I could just say that phrase, whatever it is, and turn off the video. But now I don't have something like that. So I just blab on and blab on and blab on until I'm done, which is I am right now.